Um, welcome to today's panel, Why Art Matters, Art, SFU, and Aboriginal Reconciliation, with panelists Dana Claxton, Richard William Hill, and John O'Brien. We are all aware that art is a critical reflection of our context. Art, at its best, operates to question the world's rapidly shifting cultural, political, and environmental conditions and can crack open the door to new ideas. But art and its systems can also be instrumentalized, but we'll hear more about that in a moment. So my name is Melanie O'Brien, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm the director of SFU Galleries. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Musqueam, Squamish, tsleil and Stolo nations on whose unceded lands we are gathered here today and on which we live, learn, work, and play. Today's panel is being co-presented by First Nations Studies and supported by SFU's Department of External Relations. Thanks to Joyce Schneider, whose class we are in. And um, in fact, this uh, event is going to finish not at 4.30, but at 4. And then the course will continue in this room. And the rest of you are invited to come back to SFU Gallery around the corner for some refreshments. Um, and I'd also like to thank Department Chair Deanna Reeder for suggesting this collaboration and working with SFU Galleries in a variety of capacities. So Simon Fraser University recently released a report from its Aboriginal Reconciliation Council that articulates art as an essential component in the dialogue around reconciliation and calls for a meaningful engagement with the art shown on SFU's campuses, particularly this campus. So today's panel will consider the public display of art, and particularly SFU's art collection, that includes works that are deemed inappropriate and insensitive to Indigenous culture and history. Contentious works on this campus include paintings by the Canadian artists Charles Comfort and John Innes that are currently installed in the North AQ, and we were just looking at them. So after this event, you can feel free to walk back down um, the North AQ and have a look yourself. Um, the focus today will be a large mural, 21 meters long, almost 70 feet, by Charles Comfort, and this is a detail of it up here, entitled British Columbia Pageant, painted in 1951. And it was installed here at SFU in 2004 after its acquisition the year before. The mural had been commissioned for Toronto Dominion Bank in Vancouver, and when that building was demolished, it was saved and donated to SFU in 2003. Charles Comfort, who we'll hear more about later, um, lived from 1900 to 1994. He was a Canadian artist who developed a reputation as a painter of murals, producing panoramic paintings and carved friezes for the Arts and Letters Club in Toronto, um, the Toronto Stock Exchange, and the Central Station in Montreal. So this is by no means a singular um, example of his work. Um, in 2004, the installation was met with protests from faculty and students opposed to its representation of Indigenous history in this province. And since that time, there have been works installed in response to the controversy in order to create dialogue, such as those by Bill Reed, Edgar Heap of Birds, and student works from the Cedar Table series. Um, but there has been a persistent question as to whether the work should be removed. So this panel will consider why and how art matters in the conversation and actions with regard to reconciliation. Beyond illustration and propaganda, how does art and its attendant critique and social history um, thinking support our changing landscape and the representation of Indigenous culture? In the context of a pedagogical post-secondary research institution, what is art's role and how do we frame its history? Today's event is meant to begin a complex conversation about art at SFU within a set of reconciliation processes. Um, so before I introduce our speakers, who I'm very excited to do so, I'd like to invite Joanne Curry, Vice President of External Relations, up to the podium to say a few words about um, SFU's Aboriginal Reconciliation Council, its goals and initiatives. So Great. take over Thank here. You. Well, yeah. I'll be very quick because I'm as interested as you as being part of this uh, amazing dialogue today. I want to also acknowledge that we are on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish and also uh, the Métis communities that call this region home. I wanted to thank uh, Melanie uh, and uh, First Nations Studies for hosting this dialogue and also shout out to William Lindsay, the original founder of the Office of Aboriginal Peoples, as we started out with the dialogue last year. As Melanie mentioned, we, had, uh, we have 33 calls of action as part of the Aboriginal Reconciliation Council. And I think as a member of the council, we were all uh, very pleased to see the importance everyone placed on art and culture, and particularly language as well, came up a lot in our consultations within the SFU community and the broader community as well. Uh, so an important dialogue today, and I'm really looking forward to participating and learning from this dialogue. So thank you all for coming out on a Thursday before the long weekend. So I'm very impressed, very impressed. I know some of you are part of a class, but I'm really glad that you all joined us today. Thank you, Molly. Thanks, Dan. OK, 
Okay, so now on to our speakers, Dana Claxton, John O'Brien, and Richard Hill, who will give presentations of about 15 minutes each, um, and then allowing us for ample time for conversation and questions afterwards. So I'm really grateful to these three remarkable thinkers for making the time to be with us here today. Uh, especially because they're from Emily Carr University and UBC, our fellow uh, post-secondary educational institutions here. Um, so Dana Claxton is an artist from the Lakota First Nations Wood Mountain Reserve in Southwest Saskatchewan. She's also an associate professor in the Department of Art History, Visual Art and Theory at the University of British Columbia. Her work has been shown widely, including um, at SFU Gallery's O'Dane Gallery in Vancouver, our um, sister space downtown, the Museum of Modern Art New York, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, Walker Art Center Minneapolis, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Sydney. She's participated in the 7th Biennial of Sydney in 2010, La Biennale de Montréal in 2007, and Le Havre Biennale d'Art Contemporain in uh, 20, sorry, 2006. And excitingly, she has a forthcoming solo exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery, and her work will be included in future group exhibitions at Crystal Bridges, Minneapolis Institute of Art, and the Belkin at UBC. Um, Richard William Hill is research, Canada Research Chair in Indigenous Studies at Emily Carr University of Art and Design. Prior to that, he taught full-time in the art history program at York University up until 2015. And before that, he was a curator at the Art Gallery of Ontario, where he oversaw the museum's first substantial effort to include Indigenous North American art and ideas in permanent collection galleries. His essays on art have appeared internationally in numerous books, exhibition catalogs, and periodicals. His column, Close Readings, featuring extended reviews on contemporary Indigenous art, ran in Fuse and C magazines, and I highly recommend you um, have a look at those. And he also has an irregular column at Canadian Art Online. And he's currently on the editorial board of Third Text, the journal Third Text. Um, John O'Brien is Professor Emeritus, Art History at the University of British Columbia. He publishes on modern art history and criticism, including Canadian art history, and is the author, co-author, or editor of 18 books and many, many articles. His current research is on nuclear photography in North America and Japan, and he has curated several exhibitions on this topic, including his current exhibition, Bombhead, at the Vancouver Art Gallery, which is also something you should definitely check out. Um, his books include Beyond Wilderness, Ruthless Hedonism, The American Reception of Matisse, Voices of Fire, Art, Rage, and Power in the State, The Flat Side of the Landscape, and David Milne and the Modern Tradition of Painting. He is also the editor of Clement Greenberg, The Collected Essays and Criticism. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dana Claxton, then we'll hear from John O'Brien, and finally, Richard Hill. So good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank uh, Melanie O'Brien for inviting me to participate today, and the other panelists as well as all of you for joining us. And I'd also like to acknowledge the spirit of the mountain and the Coast Salish people, particularly Alec Dan and Iona Paul family, as well as Yik Willipton, who have shared much with me over the last 30 years. So I wanted to um, begin with a, my talk with a few questions. And one is, um, when does art become delegitimized? Also, uh, and when art becomes unwanted, what do we do with art then? And of course, who decides that? We are currently witnessing, as First Nations, Canadian citizens, newcomers, guests, the development of a new critical analysis regarding images of Canada and the building of our nation, which, until very recently, one would have thought this nation was exclusively built by Euro-Canadian men as public images and currency have historically depicted a colonial, masculine, paternalistic meta-narrative. Okay. So there's some ideas of what I'm thinking of. So the climate at the moment calls for the removal of statues of public figures who participated in, I suppose, some early sexist and racist policies in nation building in Canada which have ranged from Edward Cornwallis, who paid bounties for Mi'kmaq uh, scalps, to statues of John A. Macdonald, who was considered anti-Indigenous as well. And I was thinking while I was going over my notes, could you imagine the thought of having to remove everything of, of John A. Macdonald, what a task that would be? And could be a waste of time and effort when we could be doing something else, right? 
Um, so the arguments surrounding such removals range from claims of erasure of Western colonial history, if such a thing is possible, to critical race theory of decentering colonial settler visual culture that supported dehumanizing and delegitimizing indigenous people amongst other marginal groups. So here's a John A. McDonald that somebody um, didn't like. And then the uh, one of the uh, Cornell uh, being removed, actually, it has been removed out of uh, uh, Halifax, I think it is. Um, so the uh, mural we're thinking of um, is here. And if we read this, sorry, it's so uh, well lit <laughs> at the moment. But if we read this image from the left to right, uh, it begins with this crude image of the Northwest Coast totem figure, um, uh, thereby possibly situating an indigenous presence. And then as we move right to the end of the other image, the entire mural is, flat, is flanked by Northwest Coast indigenous visuality. Part of the foundation, and I'm not sure if you can completely see it, sorry, rests upon the depiction of Northwest tribal uh, what would you like? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Just a little bit, and then people can really see it. Yeah, that's good. Thank you. So, anyways, it's being flanked side by side with uh, Northwest Coast totem figures, and so part of the foundation rests upon the depiction of Northwest Coast tribal motifs as well. You can see some of them throughout there. Um, the names of colonial explorers are printed on the bottom, and one of the names is of a new channel chief. Minakwani is known uh, to have uh, greeted as well as warred with various explorers over the years. On the bottom edge of the mural, there is a staggering of these images that almost support the colonial machine. Sort of they go, they're, they're staggered. So sort of every, every 10 miles or something indigenous, right? Um, so it, it could be appear, appearing to support the entire colonial machine, perhaps suggesting uh, the commer that commerce and capitalism that the mural depicts is a result of indigenous foundations and land, water, and air. Or failing this, how do we read these images? And what do these images mean aside from the artist using them as decoration? The flanking of the sides uh, and partial foundation could act almost as an enclosure of sorts. The colonial figures are surrounded, uh, yet the sky allows for escape or possibility. It's almost certain that Susan Point or Yigwilipton would have depicted a much different British Columbia pageant. And although keep in mind that the Indian Act criminalized Northwest Coast communities from quote, appearing in any public dance, show, exhibition, stampede, or pageant wearing traditional regalia. So at the time that this was painted, it was against the law for Indian people to be wearing this traditional regalia in public. Let's keep that in mind. So what does pageant mean? The Oxford Dictionary says that it's a public quote, a public entertainment consisting of a procession of people in elaborate and colorful costumes or an outdoor performance of a historical scene, end of quote. And what is a mural? Again, going to the dictionary, a painting or other work of art executed directly upon the wall. So a directly upon the wall we want to keep in mind as well when we're thinking about this work. So, and John will speak uh, more about Charles Comfort's practice, but what I wanted to substantiate is that he was a legitimate Canadian artist of renowned national success during his time he studied art and was also a professor of art. He resided within the professional field of art, and currently a number of Canadian auction houses carry his work, and he's in many public collections. So he was a substantial Canadian artist. So that's my concern about censorship, obviously. So how do we analyze and value artworks that become problematic from one generation to the next? Obviously, this mural was deemed satisfactory and non-offensive, during the time of its commission, and by the artist himself. Um, and I'm assuming as well as the viewing public, whom I'm assuming viewed this artwork in the bank for 50 years. And then of course we have to question, is the bank really a place to view art? Um, so what are the dangers of this work? 
Does it normalize a capitalistic and colonial mentality of domination over indigenous land and resources? Does it allow for cultural appropriation with the use of Northwest Coast indigenous visual culture? Are indigenous voices and histories being silenced? And even though there is imagery uh, and indigenous male bodies in this image, at least there's something, right? But that, we, that, but quite not quite good enough. But you know, if we think of some criticism around the group of seven, it was always there was this complete erasure of the indigenous body. So there is the indigenous body in this. They're working, of course, Emily Carr. Um, so you know, I was thinking about well, what is propaganda? Quote again from the Oxford Dictionary: the spreading of ideas, information, or rumor for the purpose of helping or injuring an institution, a cause, or a person. Um, so, I was, if we think there was a, uh, the, the culture industry enlightenment as mass deception with Theodore and Derno, I'm quoting this, quote, boundaries are fluid between propaganda and the capitalist culture industry, both using the same persuasive techniques to mask the real conditions under capitalism. So, as we can see, this is all about industry, this is about capitalism, a celebration of capitalism, and where is the where is the indigenous uh, voice within it all, or you know, land rights, or even uh, at this point, of course, indigenous people didn't even have the land uh, rights to their own land, right? And I think also the the reservation pass system was still going on. For those of you in indigenous studies, you probably know some of these discrepancies. So pageant we have here, as well as a historical scene, and do we have propaganda, a public action? of spreading ideas, a mural, art that's directly on the wall. So there's a couple of things at play here. This mural is very complicated and complex because on the one hand, the imagery in this work is sort of a baseline colonialism and capitalism. And it, quote, masks the real conditions of capitalism, end of quote, which would have been the exploitation of Indian land and resources. So while at the same time it has been painted, while rather, at the same time it has been painted by a very real professional and dedicated artist. But commissions for banks sometimes can be slippery. Um, so uh, what I'm trying to say, uh, oh, also, pardon me, in terms of uh, Charles Comfort, is that um, he painted much better murals, I have to say. There's a couple of murals that were really great. And so perhaps this is where the problem lay, is that doing commercial work for institutions at that time, you end up with these soldiers of capitalism exploiting indigenous land. And even though the Northwest Coast is in this image, it's difficult to claim that there was a transaction or negotiation going on with uh, uh, Euro-Canadian uh, explorers of the time. Certainly, there is a homogeneity to Charles Comfort's work. They are non-threatening to any state or public norms, and they are quite bourgeois and common, really, when you look at his overall body of work. Um, the Comfort images uh, support a type of Euro-colonial reading of the landscape, but with indigenous pillars. By the very fact that he has crudely painted indigenous visual culture and people, May be, represent, may be representing the artist's own consciousness, perhaps, to indigenous uh, histories or realities, however colonial in nature this is, right? So he, his awareness might have been trite, but did he have awareness is what I'm wondering about. Comfort has been in mural trouble before. And this was uh, Captain Vancouver from 1939, which was located in the Hotel Vancouver for 30 years, with these submissive-looking indigenous men almost bowing to the Euro captains. Frankly, I find this work to be completely homoerotic and don't really know <laughs> what is going on in this image. So my concern as an artist is the issue of censorship. And we should always all be concerned about the issue of censorship. What does censorship mean? Back to the dictionary. Quote, the suppression of, or prohibition of any books, films, news, etc., that are considered obscene, politically unacceptable, or a threat to security, end of quote. 
So this is where it gets very slippery because who determines, of course, obscene? Who determines uh, politically unacceptable and who determines a threat to security? I wanted to think about this work by Kent Monkman. Um, what one generation deems offensive could be another generation's norm. If we think of his work here, take for example Kent Monkman, Wedding at Sodom. He is queering as well as indigenizing the, the frontier, as well as sexualizing it. This painting may even be offensive to some today. Another example of Kent Monkman, Cree Master, it's called, which considers male sexual desire amongst Mounties and Indians. These works are racially charged and reveal moments in history that are not spoken about, and I suppose forms of forbidden love as well as, well as interracial homosexual desire. Another work by Kent Monkman. There's also the concern in the indigenous community with his use of the war bonnet. We think of the politics of who gets to wear a bonnet, and we know that the hip hop band, uh, A Tribe Called Red, has asked people not to wear war bonnets to their, to their, their concerts or to Coachella, these things. Please don't wear a, head, a, a war bonnet. But is this problematic that we have uh, Kent Monkman wearing a war bonnet? For some, it's, it's very much a problem, and for others, he's making art. He should have the freedom to do what he wants. Oops. Oh, I'm not sure. I'll just keep going, though. So although the Charles Comfort muse, uh, mural isn't unpacking sexuality, as a commissioned work for a bank, it depicts industry histories upon, uh, um, uh, upon indigenous land. Oh, it just goes back to, doesn't seem to go to where it needs to go. Um, upon indigenous land, water, and air. Oh, OK. Thank you. <laughs> so I question now how, sorry about that. So I question now, um, how do we, that's what we can leave it, that's OK. Um, how do we view this mural as art? Maybe I'll just go back to it. Or is it a commercial quasi-advertisement that is in shadow of Canadian imperialistic propaganda? What is it exactly? now residing in a university named after an explorer in a high traffic hallway. The mural has been stripped from its original context of a bank wall and placed in a university hallway, two sites of power and domination, finance and education, uh, with vested interest that reproduces their respective power. And they both had complex relationships com and compromised relationships with indigenous communities. So, this mural was never made for gallery exhibition space and now resides in a very slippery terrain. It's challenging to apply, I believe, any exhibition theory to the work as the gallery space is kind of a place of contemplation, right? With pristine conditions of lighting and temperature. But this high traffic hallway where it now resides provides a fleeting moment for the viewer. In some ways, it's taken out of the discourse of fine art if it was ever there. And uh, since the bank wall is now not a place for the proper viewing of this art. So I'm wondering too, how, how was it originally viewed? How is it being viewed now? And is it being viewed as quote fine art or art, art at all? Which is a sort of decoration that you walk by when you're, when you're cruising by. So perhaps it's not art or no longer art. Or has it ever, has it always been strictly commercial art? Which is quote art used for advertising and selling. And what is being sold then is a type of conquest of indigenous resources uh, and industry is being sold as well as Emily Carr watching on as she paints her Indians is being sold. So I'm curious about a few things. If we destroy or hide art, what does that say about our ability to have a critical discussion about problematic images? Unfortunately, with any colonial enterprise, there are histories of legal subjugation based on commonly held beliefs of inferior racial or sexual categorizations. These hierarchies, which allowed for systematic and structural dehumanization, and with public, and poli public policy as well as legal policy supporting that structural dehumanization, flowed into Canadian art history. And it flowed into his work here. Um, so comfort has painted what 
most other Canadian artists were painting at the same time. And Indians were somewhere in the picture or not at all. So it's not, he wasn't painting something that wasn't part of the common breath being, you know, breathed at the moment. So in 1951, under the Criminal Code of Canada, Indigenous people had to be granted uh, the, uh, had been granted the right to vote in public elections and indigenous women uh, the ability to vote in their own tribal elections at the same time this was being painted, right? As well as Indian nations could finally seek legal counsel to determine the theft of our lands. So prior to that, it was against the law to hire a lawyer to work on land claims. What does that mean when the state is making something illegal for you to hire a lawyer, right? Could possibly be within the realm of fascism. It's complex. We have a complex history here. So what I'm attempting to say is that from McDonald to Comfort and many others, they, they were thinking, acting, and doing was what was believed to be proper. And, and it was believed to be proper, right, and just at the time. And so this assumptive type of imperial logic has now caught up with Canada. So that's why we're here today, right? And uh, so we find ourselves here today in the realm of uh, whatever people deem reconciliation may or may not be. And so how do we reach some type of whatever reconciliation is through visual culture? So of course, there are always expect, except, exceptions to all of this, right? But the enterprise of Canada's imperialist past um, was you know, race, gender, and sexuality based. So as we unpack art, Canadian public policy, the legal system and such, we will continually encounter these problematics because of the nature of the history of our country that partially informs the present. So it's also the nature of decolonization, right? When, it, it, when you start deconstructing anything, you're gonna you know, tear it apart and run into things that can be scary or difficult and sad. So, or amazing, right? So there are a few things at play here. The potential of censorship, as well as the decentering of colonial narratives. The potential is, of art is propaganda without consent. I also thought about that, in that meaning that if indeed the artist was merely depicting history, has he done so in a way that confuses colonial domination with the freedom of art making? Charles Comfort, as a legitimate Canadian artist, painted this mural, which has become offensive to some, and he is not here to defend himself. I cannot defend him or this work, but what I can defend is no censorship in the arts. So those are some of my thoughts. That's yours. Thank you. Thank you. You've stolen my thunder in certain places. <laughs> um, thank you. I'm going to talk around. I guess I have to, how do I move forward on this? Like that? Good. I'm going to talk around the mural. I'll land on it a couple of times to say something, but I want to provide a um, a set of contexts for it, rather than actually take the, the object itself or the subject matter of the object and uh, unpack it. So the first thing to say, and you said this, Dana, but there was an immense mural painting movement in Canada in the late 19th century and through until about mid 20th century. So, so this particular work done in 1951 is sort of the, the fag end of the mural movement in more ways than one. It's the fag end of it in the sense that it's over by then. The commissions aren't coming in. They aren't being generated. Um, easel painting, smaller easel painting is what is wanted if it's, or, and, and other forms of decorative programs um, such as B, BC Hydro building, BC binning, which is you know, abstract mosaics. Um, the second thing to say is that many have said about that mural painting movement in Canada that it was apolitical. 
It was non-political. It did not have propaganda intentions. It didn't have political intentions. Um, and to the, to the minds of those that have said this, this is political art. What's being done by the Mexican muralists at the same time? This is done within just a few years, two years of Captain Vancouver in the Hotel Vancouver. And this is a work by uh, Orozco. Uh, it's in uh, Guadalajara, 1937. It's one section of an enormous mural. Uh, Diego Rivera painted them, um, and uh, 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 Siqueiros and others as well. And people might also point to the WPA murals, the New Deal murals in the United States, many of which had deliberate political content to them, talking about the out of work, the dispossessed, but from a very particular status point of view. So we have a mural movement that is claimed to be apolitical. And by apolitical, I mean this, a work like this, John Lehman, before the white man came, 1933, again the 30s, very close to the other murals we're talking about. And you see up in the rondelle at the top in the legislative buildings, um, a prelapsarian scene um, of absolute harmony, Eden, which is posited to exist before the white man comes, which then puts this back into the, into the far history. Nexis pa maintenant, right? Um, and by, by definition, it is not just the vanishing Indian, but the vanished Indian. So it is political. Um, it's political, though, in a different way than the immediate concerns of Rivera, Siqueiros, um, and Orozco. But it's more complicated than that. This would not normally be included, and this is the photographer, not, not the artist. This would not normally be included as part of the Canadian mural movement for two reasons. One, it doesn't fit the, the overall look of it and the trajectory of it. And two, it was commissioned, these paintings were commissioned as well as the other decorative works um, by the Great Northern Railway for, its, uh, for a hotel in the Waterton Lakes area. Hotel still a stand, or did it burn down recently? I think I, I, I can't, anyway, I, I went about five or six years ago because I had to see it. Um, and, um, and so what you see here are these paintings that were commissioned by um, Bloodfoot warriors um, talking about uh, battles, including present battles over land. So not, not just in the past, absolutely living. And they are being encouraged by the Great Northern Railway and by the hotel, because what the hotel wants to present is, is an, as a native presence uh, in, in, the, in, in the present moment. Um, so it's a, an extremely different kind of mural. It, I mean, it's done for touristic purposes, but it's also a place of, of, of engagement and resistance for the Blackfeet uh, at that particular time and the Bloods of that time, some of whom were Canadian. Of course, the border was porous. So we have to keep in mind that the, the mural movement, um, as defined, the Canadian one that had so many works produced um, during it, was, um, was not singular. Um, you said this, Dana, to a degree, but I want to push it a little bit further, that mural painting is a function of the architecture that, that holds it. Um, so here we see it um, as installed um, around the corner from us and down the way. I don't know how the photographer got such a clear view of it, because when we were looking at it, I, I didn't get a singular view of it, but maybe... Um, Maybe there was a way of doing that. Um, or maybe it's in a different place here than it was there. So we see it here um, in an educational institution. Um, and it has come from a bank at Pender and Hastings that got knocked down, which is why it got offered here. So it's moved from a money-changing institution to an idea-changing institution. 
different kinds of institutions, although the cynical amongst us might say, well, they're working from the same playbook, right? Um, uh, that they're both part of a neoliberal construct that we should be aware of, so we shouldn't make too much of a difference in the meal. But there is some level of difference that is going on that I think we want to hold on to when we think about um, its placement here at SFU. In a world of, you know, where in a room like this, I hope there'll be some objections raised from certain quarters where there's a critical exchange of ideas. If you did that in the bank, you might get shot. <clears throat> So here they are. I, I give you a, I couldn't find the exact bank. I went hunting in UBC's slide collection, 240,000 slides, and not one of the TD Bank at Pender and Hastings. But uh, so here you, I pulled a couple of things off the net. So there we are. Um, if you were to see this ocean liner, the Mauritania, the biggest ship in the world at the time and the most luxurious, um, in a bank, you might rightfully conclude that it had made some very successful investments in shipping, transportation, industry, energy. That's what it announces. Wouldn't be there otherwise. And so I think we have to assume that um, that the mural, that the comfort mural, did the same sort of work in the bank in a, in a I think, a more complex way than uh, simply an ocean liner, but it is, it is there to do work. It wouldn't have been commissioned otherwise. And I'm, I choose the ocean liner in part because you see an anchor right here at the far left in front of a totem, which is in, you know, dark and shadowy. Uh, as I was saying to Richard earlier, pushed back into an invalid region. And down here you see the propeller, also of a boat, and an even darker totem pushed back into the recesses. Um, that's not by accident. That is absolutely deliberate, um, uh, a deliberate iconography that comfort is generating um, to make his point about progress um, and material advancement. So comfort was an artist for hire. And he gave those hiring him what they wanted. He glorified white identity, material progress, as the salient features of the modern nation state. He was professional or not Dana. He was a professional artist. He was in the, in the army. There's a photograph of him that looks a lot like this right here. I don't, I'm not saying that's a self-portrait, but I think there's a lot of self-identity with it. Um, you know, the binoculars standing up. Um, but at this point, he's, I think he's getting pretty close to being a hack artist. And I will tell you why. Um, and that will be the last five minutes of what I have to say. Uh, in other words, he's not Wagner making great music, though he's anti-Semitic. He's not Ezra Pound making extraordinary poetry, though he's doing broadcast on Italian radio. He's not Philip Johnson, who's a Nazi sympathizer, but uh, quite a remarkable architect until he went off the rails. So um, he is not that. Um, all those are professional, but they have work that, that I think is, it is more productive to talk around in some ways than this kind of work, right? <clears throat> At one, so Comfort was a professional artist. He could do just about anything he wanted. He could, here's an early painting, 1929. He really knows how to throw paint around. You know, he's talking about 
uh, Andre Gide, Ole, Aldous, Aldous Huxley right here. He's, he's um, showing that he, you know, he, he, he knows um, about modern existentialism, Avon Lalette's. Um, and it is absolutely a modernist painting. It looks absolutely fresh, as if it could have been done much more recently than that. And it's one of the, the best works that he did from 1929. But then, um, we, this is just before the Depression. So it's the dreamer, there's wealth, there's the dressing gown. And then you get the Depression, and he does a work like this, which is equally accomplished. Um, Charles Comfort, young Canadian, obviously out of work, right? Suitcase in hand, a watercolor, um, but large, um, a, a work that, that shows, um, shows despondency, um, even a darkness to the sky, painted not in the bright colors of the dreamer, but in the darker monotone colors of blacks and dark blues, browns, grays. And in a very different style. This is more the style of American regionalism. Um, and then you've got, um, <clears throat> for the Toronto Stock Exchange, this particular work, that's Charles Hill, for those of you who know the recently retired, or maybe five or six years ago retired, curator of Canadian art at the National Gallery. Um, an enormous mural called The Romance of Nickel from 1937. It was that that partly got him the commission for the Toronto Stock Exchange, we're using the same Art Deco style, again a different style. This man's a chameleon, uh, different style, um, uh, paints this huge mural that's now at the National Gallery. And then 1939, he's doing something different yet again, right? He's doing this. This is a kind of, a kind of debased cubism, homoerotic or not, it's debased cubism. And uh, so I show the, the Hotel Vancouver beside it, again reaching for the sky in the chateau style to the glorification of, of railways, industry, and travelers, and passengers, and the business people, as well as the tourists who are part of it. And, uh, and in this, much more so than in the mural around the corner, um, the towering figures of um, Captain Vancouver and his two midshipmen um, over the three First Nations figures. Gosh, I've reached the end. Um, <laughs> going. Um, so just to repeat, here's an artist of enormous ability. He was actually, and administrative ability, he was director of the National Gallery of Canada for a while. Um, he was successful in the army. Wherever he went, he was successful. And in some sense, well, not in some sense, I would say that he was successful because he knew how to bend to what people wanted from him, and he gave it to them. Thank you. Uh, I should just leave it, actually. Oh, oh OK. okay. <laughs> I, I don't have. <clears throat> Hi. Um, this is working, I assume. You'll tell me if it isn't. Um, thank you for the chance to be here, I think. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was getting my hair cut uh, earlier today, and uh, the hairdresser asked, you know, what are you, what are you doing this afternoon? And I gradually explained what I was doing. And she said, that sounds controversial. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so um, I'm here to embrace that reality, I guess, um, in a certain sense. And um, I don't, I don't want to, although I, if you hadn't heard from uh, Dana and John and the, all the interesting things they said about this work, I might start differently. but. Um, I left myself kind of wide open on this uh, talk um, so that I could see if there was any place I could add something uh, productively. And that's what I'm going to try to do. And then hopefully um, uh, watch the time enough so that we actually have uh, a conversation afterwards, which uh, I think would be really valuable. 
Um, to me, there, there's really, as, as we you already have a, a clear sense, there's two um, key issues at stake here. And I think for myself, and I get the sense that this is how um, all of us are, are feeling, um, there's a, an issue about what this painting is and what it's doing um, in itself and in the, in the context that it's in right now. Um, and then there's the issue about what to, what to do with it. And obviously that's a, a question that it's really going to be uh, up to the SFU community to answer for itself. Um, so I'm not here trying to, in a way, say what to do. I'm trying, uh, I'm here to show you what some of the issues that from my point of view are um, and what some of, maybe some of the possibilities might be. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was um, talk about a couple of other things that we could add to um, the reading of this painting. Um, and I, I agree in a sense that it's a, it, it's a pretty bad painting <laughs> uh, in a certain sense. Um, and in a way, I want to try to argue that um, because it's bad in a certain way, um, I almost feel like this might be its greatest moment uh, rather than its worst um, because, well, well, we'll see how we go. But um, uh, a couple of other things to point out. I mean, I, I feel like this is, as Dana suggested, um, an extremely complicated and problematic um, depiction of the history of British Columbia, the way in which... Uh, uh, that colonial history played out, the role of indigenous peoples in, in that. Um, there's complications to the presence um, in all sorts of ways. And a couple of other things that just came to, have come to my mind in terms of this uh, have to do with how, um, how looking is happening in this painting. Because there's an enormous amount of looking going on. Um, spy glasses, binoculars, um, that's all kind of showing you people looking. Um, but then there's also the way that space is broken up in these extremely strange ways um, where we're, we're gazing in as if on a, a little vignette of some scene that's taking place. And I think um, this made me think immediately of uh, some of the conversation that's gone on around um, uh, uh, Hudson River School painting in the US and other things. Uh, about the kind of a, the acquisitive gaze, this kind of looking on as a way of taking possession um, through through looking. I think that's really clear that that's going on in this work. Um, and there's some very funny things that we're noticing um, just when we were looking at the painting, very hard to see in reproduction, but um, there's actually a kind of, um, uh, we were wondering possibly kind of optical uh, effects or that, that suggest we're looking through instruments or something like that, mm -hmm. where parts of the image um, get kind of carved out by the, by the framing apparatus that's, that's blocking off space. And one of the things that really struck me as kind of provocative uh, around this is the way that there's a, a kind of line that comes down, missed my laser pointer right now. <laughs> <laughs> And it, it dips into this little figure of the, the argillite, um, the, those kind of argillite figures there, and it kind of carves a little bit out of the top of them. It's like it's, it's it, so there's a, a kind of um, question about um, how, who's overlapping into whose space um, and what's going on in that case. And that made me think of um, a series of arguments that uh, a scholar named Klaus Lubers made about um, the way that um, it starts with, that, that discussion starts with, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now I feel at home. <laughs> Talk about looking and pointing, uh, which is what this painting is all about. <laughs> um, but Lubbers argued that um, in these treaty metals, you would see, um, a representation either allegorically or through some historical figure of uh, a representative of the state. His discussion was about the US, but Canada had similar kinds of images. And 
Um, and he, he described the way space was used in those images um, as a form of specious, specious symmetry. Um, it was symmetrical in the sense that you had indigenous people on one side and uh, represent, representatives of the colonial government on the other, um, but it, it was actually not symmetrical when you looked at what was actually going on in terms of how space was being occupied, that the Europeans were always getting the upper hand in one way or another. And so I think that question about who's where um, is quite uh, interesting. Um, oh dear, sorry. I now I've realized I got my slides out of order for this conversation. So, um, and it's the ambiguity of that um, and the complication of it in that other work that's so different from this work, where the, the spatial relations between people is so obviously hierarchical um, that the moment you look at this, it's immediately revealed to any thinking person that there's um, subordination and that uh, Captain Vancouver has a, a big package, I guess, as he said. <laughs> but um, but this, this kind of question um, about uh, how people occupy spaces, I guess just worth thinking about. Um, and it made me think about um, this image from a, uh, the, an illustrated um, booklet that was, or book that was sold um, at the uh, 1876 Centennial Exposition in which you have representatives of all the people, allegorical representatives of all the peoples of the earth, and they're all um, kind of forced into these awkward postures that um, portray their, their standing as peoples. Uh, so the, the kind of, um, the, the arrogant gesture that's being made here is that, um, that America is now shoulder to shoulder with Britannia uh, as equals, um, which is a, would have been a daring claim uh, for America to make at the time. Um, but then you have all the other peoples of the earth um, crouching at various degrees of subordination until you have Africans and indigenous North Americans kind of right down on, the, uh, right down on their knees. Um, and this is a kind of um, a symbolic representation that would have been um, perfectly readable to, uh, to anyone at the time in which that initial Charles Comfort work um, certainly participates. But when you get into more subtle examples, um, like the Saskatchewan legislature, for example, I wanted to give a Canadian example, which has a, oops, there it is, small dot, um, a relief sculpture um, at the top of this pediment, um, which depicts uh, indigenous world on one side and uh, a settler world on the other, one of hunting and gathering versus one of agriculture. Um, um, you have, again, this, this idea of a, a symmetry, right? This is a specious symmetry that I was talking about, um, except there's a few things going on. One is in so many of these representations, um, because we're used to reading from left to right, the indigenous world is in the beginning on the left, and we have a sense of movement towards a non-indigenous mm -hmm. future. Um, we have a, a fundamental breach of symmetry in that um, this kind of figure of Britannia at the center um, actually is occupying the key real estate of the, the work, so it's not balanced in that sense. And then the gesture that seems most telling of all is that there's a cornucopia, a horn of plenty, um, on the indigenous side. So this is representative of all the wealth of the nation. Um, and of course, Britannia has just hooked it with her arm. <laughs> and, um, so it's very revealing. Um, <laughs> so I think these are all kind of questions that you can read back into that painting to try to figure out what's happening uh, there. And uh, I think it's a uh, it's complex and tricky thing to do. Uh, where am I? Oh, I'm, I can't go there. Okay. <laughs> um, This is a problem with winging it a little. <laughs> um, what was I going to say from there? I must have been good. <laughs> um, I guess the, uh, what I need to get onto then is, um, and it is a kind of question about what, what this does for us. And 
Um, I said that maybe the painting that we're talking about um, is at its most important right now um, because it's come into crisis, right? The thing about, um, I, when uh, Melanie and I were emailing back and forth about this, we were talking about, you know, is this mural a kind of monument in a sense, uh, especially as it's been relocated into this space? Um, and uh, to a certain extent, I think that's, um, that's the case. And um, I think murals and monuments and other public art um, often operates in this very strange way where once, uh, when it, it, there's a period when um, it functions as originally intended, that it tells the narrative that that society, or at least the elites of that society who commissioned the work uh, wanted to tell. Um, and then there's um, a period after that probably where it, it simply functions very covertly um, because it's, it's there, it's doing its job um, ideologically, um, but in a way we all ignore it. You know, you, we walk past all these monuments all the time without really being aware of what they're doing to us. And um, they become, as they, as they become less and less um, uh, acceptable to us in different ways, the, the kind of tension, the things that are anachronistic with our current values become more and more um, problematic. Um, but they, they still seem for a long period of time to exist kind of in the manner of a public secret. Um, that there's this thing that we all know, uh, this horrible colonial history. Um, we are developing us, I say we, I don't know who the hell I mean by we in this conversation. <laughs> this conversation. Um, uh, <laughs> Usually when I say we, I mean we indigenous people, but obviously I'm using it in a different way right now. Um, but we, we end up in this situation where we have this relationship um, where um, this thing that has been the dominant idea and then become a, prob a kind of problematic but um, still below the surface idea, kind of a, a public secret, then erupts productively into a crisis. And I feel like this is the moment when it's erupted into a crisis. And really, this is the moment when suddenly a pretty bad artwork is actually allowing a, a, a more interesting conversation. Right? So I, I think that's worth thinking about. And um, the question then is how to make that work in a way that, um, that doesn't allow the, um, the, the work to simply reproduce that colonial ideology, but to create a situation in which um, you know, every time we see it or in whatever circumstance we see it, maybe that corridor is not the right place to be seeing it. Um, but when we see it, um, that crisis is, is visible to us. And I think a lot about, um, uh, I wanted to give a couple of other examples really of um, cases where indigenous artists have raised a kind of question around monuments. And the one that sticks with me the most is, um, uh, Jeff Thomas, the Onondaga photographer, um, who had this long relationship with the Champlain Monument at Nepean Point in Ottawa. Um, and this is a, a, a picture of the monument as it originally existed. Uh, Champlain is, of course, at the top, elevated way above the rest of us lowly uh, people, holding his astrolab, his symbol of navigation. Um, and at the base of the sculpture, Kneeling, I apologize for the poor quality of the slide. Uh, kneeling is uh, a, the Indian scout figure. Um, he was originally going to be kneeling in a canoe, but uh, war metal shortages apparently uh, led to the, the, this is such a Canadian thing to do. Is, <laughs> uh, we want a memorial, but we don't really want to pay for the whole thing. Um, so, um, so he's there kneeling. and, and because he's not kneeling in his canoe, as the kneeling becomes even more, uh, of course, an act of subordination, never mind the fact that he's standing 10 or 15 feet below, or kneeling below um, the heroic figure of Champlain. Um, this work erupted into crisis and re-significance in um, the early 90s when the Assembly of First Nations started to protest against it and uh, demanded its removal. And uh, the, one of the lone voices that I knew uh, arguing to retain it was Jeff Thomas, 
uh, who had been photographing, he had made a photo practice about going around and trying to find these sorts of representations of indigenous people um, in, uh, especially in urban spaces where he lived. Um, and so he had developed a kind of valuable relationship with this object um, in terms of trying to understand what that history was. And so he actually said, um, don't take it down. Um, leave it, but contextualize it somehow so that people, because otherwise um, you're simply removing the, this history, of, the visibility of the history of this racism, um, and people are just going to proceed in, in a kind of ignorance. And of course, then <laughs> um, Jeff spent a lot of time photographing different people, uh, including his son Bear, who some of you may know as Bear Witness. Um, um, now more famous than Jeff. <laughs> um, and uh, he photographed Jeff and a whole bunch of other people in relation to the monument in all kinds of ways that reveal things about what contemporary indigenous life was uh, about and what these issues were. And um, finally, the, um, and drew very nice visual relations that were, uh, were going on as well. And then eventually, um, the government decided that they could solve this problem um, by simply removing the scout figure and relocating him um, across to another part of the park. Um, <clears throat> so he's still in the same, in this photograph especially, in the same subordinated <laughs> relationship, but it's been made visually difficult to, you know, you need Jeff Thomas to then help you see that. Um, and of course, the beautiful title, Why Do Indians Always Have to Move? Um, <clears throat> So this is one, uh, one thing that you can uh, think about in terms of what, what's going to happen with this, uh, this mural. Um, I guess the other, the other thing that strikes me a lot, um, and I can just point you to, um, there was a controversy about this painting when it was acquired um, in Charlottetown. Um, and there were two, um, sorry, there was a, an exhibition um, with four indigenous artists uh, responding to it, uh, including David Neal, um, and that's the, the work there, um, that, uh, that were, were, were kind of done. And I think, I'm sorry to be kind of skipping a little bit all over the place, but why I'm showing that is um, there are a whole bunch of curatorial and exhibitionary tools that we might have to work with, um, and all of them have problems, um, and all of them have potential. And I think what makes the, um, this mural so especially challenging um, is its scale, right? I mean, this, its monumental scale means that um, anything that responds to it has to be able to compete with that sense of our sense that big things are important. Now, anyone who knows the history of indigenous art, especially from the plains, uh, like uh, uh, Dana will, will know that uh, scale is not the sign of the importance of an object uh, you can have many small, beautiful things that you carry around with you or that is as important as anything else. Um, but we still do register the occupation of space in architecture as uh, a sign of significance. And I think that's one of the real issues for me with what that work is doing in that corridor. And, and um, it's the, the scale of that work versus the, the scale of the response. Um, and so um, I guess the questions that, that float around for me is, does that work have to be in that space? And if not, what kind of space could it be in where you could have these kinds of conversations about it? Um, and I think it was a great tool for, uh, potentially for, for, um, for education. Um, and I also think that um, there's a question, um, so there's a, that question, and then there's a question about what kind of, what way can you um, uh, give people into reading it um, that, I guess to a certain extent, you know, I, I don't like hugely didactic <laughs> situations um, in relation to art, even art that is didactic and simple, kind of uh, promoting a simple message. But how, how you could do something that was as sophisticated as what Jeff has done um, and is effective um, without falling into that trap. And also, I guess, in a way that could kind of not fall into the trap of producing a kind of counter monument, which I think is the worst trap open to, to any of us in these situations is um, to say, 
um, you know, this is the wrong history. I'm going to create a monument to the right history and have it uh, face off. And you get into a lot of problems that way. And to me, it's this kind of, um, it's the anti-monumentality uh, of the contemporary art invention, intervention that's going to be most powerful. Anyway, that's enough for me for now. <laughs> Maybe you wanted to comment on the current response that does exist, um, the artworks that are kind of like in the corridor but on that opposing side of the hallway. Yeah, well, we walked through there. Yeah. We didn't spend enough time with them. Yeah. I, I mean, maybe you did, did you? I, I spent a fair amount of time Good. thinking about those, and um, um, I think they're a great start. And, um, um, and, but I think it's not, it's not enough that um, there's the Edgar Heap of Birds, which is very important because of, this, of, uh, of how, what an important artist he is, among other things. Um, but I, I think that there's just too much else going on along that corridor that's problematic um, for that work to be able to kind of hold its own against all that. And um, so, in, including as you you know kind of go down, there's the map of the routes of the explorers. There's all kinds of other things that are um, not helping. <laughs> um, so I feel like um, if if that's going to be how that gets handled, uh, then I think there needs to be more. And I don't know what the answer to that is because. Um, uh, you know, it's good. I think those kind of cur kind of curatorial problems, in a way, take time to work out. And I'm a slow thinker, but uh, I do feel like the, um, it, um, having student work is important there. But also having more work by professional art, indigenous artists, um, would also be very valuable. Um, and um, and again, I, I do question to a certain extent whether that's even the right place in the first place for that work to be. If there couldn't be some place. Um, someplace else. I mean, I, I know that's asking a lot with a work that size to even to move it, but I don't know what anyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi. Um, so this is going to be one of those question and comments. Uh, uh, so I was really interested in what you're saying, uh, and I agree. I think most of you mentioned that perhaps just kind of the busy hallway isn't really the context for sort of an active contemplation and engagement with a work of art like this. Uh, and I worry that having it there just leaves it to be the sort of background normalization of the colonial imagery that we're so used to seeing that it doesn't uh, in encourage any uh, interaction with the viewer. Um, and there's talk about moving into another context. Uh, but I'm wondering what context that might be where it would encourage that. Because although the obvious answer might be like a gallery context, um, we're kind of, we've already promoted this image so much in importance. Uh, that I just don't like it. That I don't know that I want to give it that gallery space. But I'd be really interested in, in hearing about what other contextualizations you think could encourage that kind of engagement with this sort of imagery. <clears throat> well, the narrative of industrialization that moves <clears throat> down that corridor on the other side, heading towards us from the other end, that could be reimagined. Yeah. And it, you know, I, I think. There's a lot of room to, to keep it where, I don't know whether that exact place is the right one, but I do think a public space where there is room, lots of room for <clears throat> responses, some of which might not be direct responses and others very direct responses, is a, is a real possibility. I, I think a lot of the, the work that's out there now on the industrialization of BC is just as impoverished as comfort is. It's in crisis, too. So um, I, 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 I'm imagining of the whole space um, over time, as you say, it doesn't have to be done immediately, is, could, could be, would that make you happier? I don't think anybody <laughs> thinks it belongs in an art gallery. I, I think that was clear, okay, just okay. so you know. Yeah. OK. okay. <laughs> I guess that's what I was scared of. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, in the same hallway as the Office for Aboriginal Peoples, 
And uh, on either side of the, of the office door are these small uh, weathered totems. Yeah. And the story I was told is that they were actually commissioned for when SSU opened in 65. And then at some point they were lost or they were left out in the forest or something. So maybe what we could do is take the painting and just put it out and burn them out. <laughs> <laughs> I think I know a little bit about the history of those poles because um, I, I was I, I was looking at them, and um, part of my history is I, I lived on this campus as a kid when my mom went to university as a mature student, um, and there used to be a cluster of totem poles in um, what was um, Nahino Park, and um, that park was left to rot away and be overgrown, and so were the poles for a long time, and um, I think. Two of those two must be salvaged. There were a bunch more. I'm not sure what happened to all of them. Uh, mm. I think some of them were just stolen by people. Um, so it is a kind of. Uh, it's such a funny. That is such a funny history, and yeah, maybe it's. A, I mean, there's all kind. There's all kinds of ways to let work that you don't want to languish and rot away in storage or in other places, um, and um, in a way that what. Again, it's, I think it's the scale of this work that makes it so hard because it's not like you can just bring it out when you want to do something um, and put it away. Um, one of the things that I guess I would think about if I, if I was teaching here was, um, is there some kind of pedagog... Again, but it's so big, like, how do you do that? But some kind of pedagogical use that could be made of it once in a while or something like that. Um, right. um, I, I, don't know. Somebody, I don't know. Somebody agrees with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry, Deanna. Someone's had their finger hand up at the back for a while. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. My question is about similar issues that are brought up in South Africa about the work should be do post apartheid or about state. Do you have any experience or any comments about what they are trying to do? I think they put a lot of statues in the museum, and, uh, and then there is a whole discussion. And regarding SFU, I was. Uh, Suggesting we have this uh, Terry Fox statue, but we have nobody. I was wondering whether we could have five men and five women uh, to have a story told about the history and of the students and their experiences. And uh, what do you think of putting five women and five oh. men as part of SFU? Well, I guess you're. Um wanting to see a type of gender parity, which is a good idea. But <laughs> I'm not sure. But the only thing I, I'd hesitate the there is, um, the work. in a way, um, I think it's, again, I guess it's, it's kind of returning back to this question about, you know, do you do the counter monument or do you do something anti-monumental or subversive? And um, I feel like, um, memorializing people with figurative sculpture has such a problematic history that to simply just memorialize other, you know, the, the missing people with it um, kind of misses the, the kind of formal problems of that, that mode um, and the way it's used. So um, I, would, I would rather see um, um, new work of whatever kind uh, by a diverse range of artists um, then to kind of kind of counter every single thing kind of individually one for one with with something like it, um, I guess. Be an awful lot of countering going on, <laughs> you know. If that was the case, right? It would be it would just be too enormous that, in, ter in terms of new original art or ideas of, it's it's complicated. Yeah, and again, I think the point that you made early in the talk is, um, you know, I was. We're kind of making the case for why this, it's important to talk about this work, and also at the same time why it's really important not to let this be the only thing we talk about, um, because we want to have the conversation about um, the new things, the uh, things that are um, there, not just because they represent <laughs> the colonial history, but because they represent indigenous ideas and all kinds of other things. Um, and so I think that, that balance is always really, um, really tricky. Um, and this comments on the, on the South African experience of Russian 
experience or even Iran's the government. I'm sorry, I'm going to cut you off because I think we've got to keep on this task here. And I'm going to, sorry, Deanna, go ahead. You had a good yeah. um, Thanks. So, Sharad, we'll talk about that at the, at the comedy <laughs> afterwards. Um, no, I, I just, before, taking your point about pedagogy, so in First Nation Studies, we do actually, because our, our, our is just down the hall, we'll walk students over and it's an opportunity to go and talk about the mural and then go back to class. And, I, and so, when this whole issue came up, I, you know, I, and I saw the ARC report, I, I really thought, oh, well, no, it's balance, it's a chance to remember the past and talk about all these great issues. And then I had a, a really wonderful um, young student, just an indigenous student, just come up and say, you know, about how, how it hurts her, like how, how painful it is. And I mean, we don't, it's not, of course, it's not just this painting, it's the context of all the doors that are closed and, of, you know, yeah. racism sustained, you know, day by day on top of a history of, of that. And I guess I just wondered, uh, you know, if, if um, you know what what responses you might have to that, or you know the uh, you know ways to not just respond to it intellectually but emotionally. And I, the only thing I could come up with as we're talking is wondering if we could just turn it upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. And I can also just say that in the past there have been student responses to it. The Rita Cora Patrick in the in the mid two thousands. Um, wrap that entire mural and all the John Innes paintings in brown paper. Oh. And we remounted that a few years ago just to remind yeah. ourselves. Yeah. 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 I think there would be, I, I think that's an idea to, uh, that I like talking about more than doing. Uh, in this <laughs> sense. Uh, um, no. <laughs> well, the plexi, because I, I guess um, as problematic as the mural is, I find, I, I feel like. Um, and maybe this was something you were saying about censorship in a way, but um, I really do feel like an artist has a, even posthumously, uh, a kind of, um, I want to respect the integrity of the thing that they did. Um, and I guess the plexiglass is temporary, so you could put it there and then take it away or something like that. Um, but I would feel like that would, um, if we're going to start doing that for this artwork, um, it could go a long way, you know. I, I would start to feel uncomfortable pretty quickly. I think, um, just because I, I I I know so many artists, and I I can imagine what you would think if in 50 years uh, someone found some aspect of your work offensive and started changing it. Um, you know, it might not. It, it's something that's a, a little disturbing to think about. Um, in terms of the the thing being painful, um, I never know what to do about that, and I feel genuinely conflicted about it because. Um, it's painful to me too. I, 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 I um, you know, I, I grew up in a world of uh, cowboy and Indian movies and all these things that were really they're crushing, and um, and I feel like now, <laughs> um, I, I feel so much less pained by this work now because so m many fewer people believe it anymore. Um, it feels less painful to me now. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, say the, 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 the two native studies professors. No. Going, oh, I don't know. But, <laughs> yeah. I but. don't mean. I don't mean that. I. I just feel. I mean, I'm. I'm not going to assume we're all the same age, but probably fairly close. Um, and I felt like um, that kind of stuff that was circulating when I was a kid. There was nobody saying it was wrong. You know, there, the, my mother was the only person I knew until I was went to university who said that kind of thing was wrong, um, and her friends. Um, so the fact that there's, you know, we're having this conversation, I, I feel, I don't feel that it's all better. I know it's not all better. I just feel that um, I, I feel like. I feel like I'm in a less painful relationship to that material. That's why I can look at Kent Monkman and laugh, right? That's why Kent Monkman can make fun of it because he's not, you couldn't have made a Kent Monkman painting in 1950 or 1960 or 1970, not because of the homoeroticism, because no indigenous person thought that, you know, would have been able to laugh at that material. Um, so laughing at it, being able to get to the place where you can laugh at it is super important to me. Um, because it, it, it takes away its authority much more effectively than anything else. I um, mean, I, so I think joking about this painting is, power, is a powerful thing to do, to kind of take away its authority 
in different ways. We all we all took a poke at it, actually. Uh, we if didn't I, arrange that in, in, in advance. No, we didn't. We didn't talk. If I could just add to that is that when I did see those images of it being wrapped with paper, I was just like, no, this is not right. You know, I said, this is not right, and didn't like it at all, and would never sanction anything like that. But it could be time just to have it in storage for a while. I mean, with every art collection, with every collection, things go into storage for a while, and it might just be time for it to be in storage for a while. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's, I found those images, they made me go, <clears throat> to, to see an artwork wrap like that, you know, how, regardless of how problematic it is or how, Hack, I loved it when you said he's be he became a hack artist. <laughs> and, um, I struggle with that all the time in teaching because you're always hurting your students. With, you know, I, I taught a course on representation of indigenous North American, it had this horrible title, Indigenous North Americans in Art and uh, Popular Visual Culture. Um, and I could barely get to the end of it. It was so, you know, it was so disheartening. And I, what I ended up doing eventually was um, I just, folded in contemporary artworks that address those issues all the way through. So I, every time I was feeling so just, you know, and I, I was bringing the whole, you know, the whole class with me through this horror, horror show. Um, and it was the, it's the kind of resistance and agency that makes you feel like you can get through that. But I also, you know, it makes me anxious to take, a, take it away because um, I still want them to, I still want everybody to see that, you know, because I, I, it's so easy to, to say, well, it was racist back then, and you have this kind of general sense that it was there was this inequality. But when you see things that like f are the physical evidence of that racism, um, you can't you know you can't deny it. It's powerful, and so I, I feel it's really important to you know if you're a young student and that's getting to you, and you might have to take a break from it. But at the same time, you've got to kind of rise, you know, have the strength to to grapple with it too somehow. And maybe there'll be some day when it just doesn't matter anymore, but we're not, not there yet either. <clears throat> okay, we're going to take another question. Yeah. These are my personal views. I'm not sure <laughs> plan. I really enjoyed the conversation, and I have one or two thoughts I just want to share. One is I really feel that censorship um, is a slippery slope, and um, one has to be extremely you know, careful about any form of censorship. But I was very moved by the experience I had when recently Joanne and I and others were in Winnipeg, for the um, uh, reconciliation uh, conference, we got a chance to go to the Human Rights Museum. And at the Human Rights Museum, I thought the approach that they had taken was just incredibly powerful, where it's so in your face that you're forced to think about how wrong something was at a different point in time. But if not for that, how, you know, how do you have that conversation about the Holocaust and other things? So for me personally, um, yes, I hate this painting. I lived in Heidegger for two years, so you know I'm very passionate about these things. I just feel that this constantly reminds me of how wrong things were and how we are sort of moving towards something that is better. And I find that if the original piece is not there, with especially social media and new media technologies, in 50 years when I'm gone, you know, my children might be seeing images and reading stuff that actually are not accurate, and there's nobody really there to correct because the experts may not always be there. So I just think that if there is a narrative around it, and the Vancouver Harbor campus, um, where we have a little spot there that has rights of indigenous people, the UN Declaration written in big, bold letters, and having another narrative angle of it, so that we, we stop, we think, and we have two things I just feel it's so valuable. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we have time for one more question, or perhaps that is. That's it. Okay. There's one back. Oh, there's yeah. one back there. There's one back there. Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank you all. It was really great conversation. It's hard to place the party for starting this. Um, and it's a
other places that you explored in your mind for this this work, um, what strength might be just using anthropology might have that ability to contextualize uh, the work in a more beneficial way, or uh, even the Royal British Columbia Museum? Did any other places come up? Well, I think the question of um, it's the question of scale is really problematic, and I think that um, the question of putting it back into a gallery space is also something that is not, you have more control in that space, but also the several people have said it, then you also, you give it the space that sort of it's been taking up. Um, and um, I think it's a really good question. I think it's very, very problematic for us to take it down and find a place to store it too. I mean, just sort of logistically and all of those things. So we've been thinking through all these things and I'm, I'm really not, I don't have a good um, sense of what would be the right thing or the, um, you know, I don't think putting it on another institution um, is necessarily something that would be appropriate. I do think that SFU accepted this work fairly recently and that says quite a bit about where the institution was at that time and what kinds of works were deemed acceptable just, you know, 15 years ago. So I think it's sort of incumbent on this institution to find a way to, um, not only just maintain it within the collection, but also figure out how to keep this conversation um, fluid and viable, um, which may not be about having it up at all, but maintaining it in different in different ways. So I'm not I'm not at all sure. Yeah, just walking into the building today, and I haven't been up here for a long time. But the last time I was here, that lovely big canoe wasn't there, and it's a lovely counterpoint. Yeah. Having that canoe there. The Bill Reed canoe, so yeah. Well, I wanted to thank everybody, uh, particularly <laughs> the speakers, for um, starting this conversation today.